In the late 19th century, New York City was on the verge of change as unprecedented expansion driven by mass immigration and industrialization led to rapid urbanization and the growth of neighborhoods and communities in every direction. And at least initially, the growth was a chaotic, logistical mess, causing significant infrastructure challenges as existing routes and transportation systems could not cope with the increased flow of people and goods. As a result, in the early decades of the 20th century, it became imperative to rethink and build new roads, streets, and bridges to connect the different parts of the expanding city, ensure efficient transportation, and facilitate large-scale urban development. Various solutions were considered to make it easier to cross the river. Still, with the exponential growth of commercial traffic, building a bridge capable of handling huge amounts of people while accommodating the vessels below was necessary. Ultimately, the city found its solution, and in the 1920s, the majestic George Washington Bridge, a two-tier suspension bridge that spans the Hudson, connecting two of America's most important states, was erected. This is the story of the George Washington Bridge, a testament to the power of ambition and engineering. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Let's start off with a basic fact. The name of the bridge, dedicated to the first president of the United States, George Washington, is no coincidence. You see, during the American Revolution, the Continental Army retreated from Fort Washington, New York, across the river to Fort Lee, which gives its name to the town at the western end of the bridge. Hence, this water has a strong historical importance to America. Additionally, before the construction of the George Washington Bridge, the Hudson River was more difficult to cross, and travelers relied on ferries to get from one side of the river to the other. Less than a decade after World War I, the Port Authority's first bi-state project was a system of three bridges between Staten Island and New Jersey that would help create a ring road from the New York metropolitan area to accommodate the increasing interstate traffic. Two bridges, the Outer Bridge Crossing and the Gothos, opened to traffic on the 29th of June, 1928. Both bridges are connected to major thoroughfares, particularly the Gothos, which supports regional economic activity by providing intermodal connections to the bi-state highway network, railroads, the Port of Newark, and the Newark Liberty International Airport. And I'm not exaggerating here, this provides tangible value to the region. In fact, more than $33 billion worth of regional freight moves through this area each year. Another historic first, the Port of Authority Police Department was created in 1928 to protect the two bridges, with 40 patrol officers known as bridgemen. The last of the three Staten Island crossings opened in 1931, the Bayonne Bridge, which we also have a video on. This bridge was built to replace an existing ferry route between Bayonne, New Jersey and Port Richmond on the Staten Island side. This connection was set up with the hope of stimulating residential development for commuters who worked in Lower Manhattan and wanted to live on Staten Island. For 45 years, the Bayon was one of the longest steel arch bridges in the world, beating its sister bridge, the Sydney Harbor Bridge in Australia, by 25 inches. Before these bridges were built, tunnels were constructed in the early 1920s to allow railway wagons to cross the river. The most important of these, the Holland Tunnel, opened in 1927 and was the first car-accessible crossing of the Hudson River. However, it was only through the construction of the George Washington that citizens could travel to and from New York more conveniently and quickly. Its strategic location between the Palisades in New Jersey and Washington Heights in Manhattan ensured that the imposing cliffs at either end of the bridge raised it sufficiently above the water to avoid any interference with maritime traffic on the Hudson River. Since the end of the 19th century, there have been several proposals to build a bridge across the Hudson River, including the various plans of Austrian-born engineer Gustav Lindenthal, who aimed to link Midtown Manhattan and New Jersey with a road and rail bridge of considerable size. Still, these never came to fruition due to funding problems. In 1906, the governors of New York and New Jersey proposed building a bridge across the Hudson between 179th Street in Manhattan and Fort Lee. In the same year, they formed an interstate bridge commission to build one or more bridges across the Hudson, jointly financed by two states. 
1910 report by the commission recommended Fort Lee as the ideal site, citing its favorable geography and relatively modest eminent domain challenges. In the area chosen, the bedrock was above ground, eliminating the need for elaborate foundations, as all that was needed was to level the ground. Meanwhile, in 1916, part of Lindenthal's rail link was completed with the opening of the Hellgate Bridge over the East River. But surprisingly, a protege of Lindenthal's, Othmar Amann, a Swiss engineer designated to become a key figure in bridge design, opposed his mentor's plan. Amann pointed out that Lindenthal's plan would have required expensive access to the congested center of Manhattan, leading to political controversy. After leaving Lindenthal's team, Amman proposed the construction of a bridge between 179th Street in Manhattan and Fort Lee. This bridge was designed for motor vehicles and light rail. The location chosen was also economically advantageous, as land costs were lower in Fort Lee and the Hudson was less wide in the chosen area, making construction easier and saving on materials. Amman's ideas were accepted. And so it was. The newly formed Port of Authority decided to build the bridge, and in 1925, hired Amman as chief engineer for the design and construction of the bridge. Immediately after the Port Authority announced the Hudson River Bridge project in 1925, Amman commissioned several designs for consultants. Initial plans drawn up by the Port Authority and the Regional Plan Association called for a suspension bridge with a main span of 2,700 feet, with pylons exceeding approximately 400 feet beyond the pier headlines. The final design proposed for the bridge was an engineering challenge. At 3,500 feet, the main span would have been twice the length of any existing suspension bridge. However, compared to the length of the main span, the side span between the anchors and towers are relatively short. The side spans were of different lengths, 650 feet on the New York shore and 610 feet on the New Jersey shore. Two suspension systems were considered for the Hudson River span. The first known islet system used hundreds of thin metal rods connecting the cables and the deck by islets. In contrast, the second, the wire spun system, used tens, if not hundreds of thousands of spun wire passed from anchor to anchor on the towers. As Amon considered both systems equally effective, he put the suspension system out to tender. This is where John A. Roebling & Sons, the company founded by the designer of the Brooklyn Bridge, won the contract to design the cable suspension system. Each of the four cables consisted of 61 large strands, and each strand was spun from 434 wires wound together across the river. Four 180-ton saddles at the top of each tower held the main suspension cables in place. In a revolutionary departure from the convention of suspension bridge design, Amon proposed to do away with the stiffening trusses, which seemed crazy at first because they had always been essential for suspension bridges in earlier times, when they were designed for heavy rail traffic. Instead of using trusses, Amon theorized that as the weight per linear meter of long span bridges increased, the dead weight of the deck and four cables would be sufficient to withstand the high winds, thus eliminating the need for trusses. Each of the 106 foot long deck girders weighed 66 tons. Even with a single deck only three meters deep and a depth to span ratio of one to 120, neither heavy traffic nor strong winds caused the bridge to sway. In addition to the load-bearing structure, consideration had to be given to the bridge's towers. Several tower designs were presented, drawing on Gothic, Baroque, and Art Deco conventions. One design proposed monumental Gothic towers clad in granite similar to those on the Brooklyn Bridge, which would have housed restaurants and observation decks. However, economic pressure and public opinion forced Amman to use exposed lattice structures for the 604-foot-tall 20,000 ton steel towers. Given the advances in steel construction at the time, it was decided that the steel structure alone would be strong enough to support the live and dead loads of the tower. Well, the flexibility of the structure reduced its weight and cost. The New Jersey Tower was sunk 76 feet into the Hudson, while the New York Tower was built on land to avoid the steep drop off the Manhattan shoreline. 
Both towers were comprised of 12 50-foot-long sections. Each section was floated to the piers one at a time, and for utility access, each leg of the towers houses a lift. The New Jersey Tower also houses the world's largest freestanding flag. This 475-pound U.S. flag is flown over the roadway on holidays, measuring 60 feet by 90 feet, and featuring five-foot-wide stripes and three-foot-wide stars. The foundation stone was laid on the 21st of September, 1927. By February of 1930, the bridge was half complete and two months ahead of schedule, with the opening date being in the early months of 1932. A crew of 350 was spinning the wires from each of the 36-inch wide main cables, which were 22% complete. The builders had also begun ordering steel for the deck. By April, the spinning of the main cables was half complete. The first main cable was completed at the end of July in 1930. The other three main cables were also completed by August. And as it was a jubilant moment, a ceremony was held to mark the laying of the last cable. The spinning of the main cables had taken 10 months in total. And so it was. The six-lane bridge was completed on the 24th of October, 1931, eight months ahead of schedule, for $59 million and the loss of 12 lives. Originally called the Hudson River Bridge, other names were considered, including the Palisades Bridge, the Fort Lee Bridge, the Columbus Bridge, and the Verrazano's Bridge. This was all, of course, before the Port Authority finally settled on the George Washington Memorial Bridge in 1930. The name was later shortened to the George Washington Bridge. This was such a big deal that over 30,000 people attended the bridge opening event, and many more listened to the opening ceremonies on the radio. Ironically, however, the festivities also caused a massive traffic jam around the city. You guys know what I'm talking about. This was basically the type of traffic jam that will literally make your hair fall out. And as long as we're on that topic, if hair loss is a concern of yours, keeps has you covered. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and more affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness from the comfort of their own homes. This discreet, affordable treatment is personalized, delivered to your doorstep and on your schedule. On a more personal note, as someone who comes from a very long line of men with hair loss, I'm already stocking up on Keeps for when my day comes, and my wife, she's all in on that plan. It's also been tested and proven to work with FDA-approved treatment options. According to clinical studies, treatments offered by Keeps are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35%. In addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps offers hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade. So whether you're looking to slow hair loss, stimulate growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has you covered. This loved and trusted solution has helped nearly 1 million men keep their hair and has over 4,500 five-star reviews to back that claim. So check it out. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash its history or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash its history. Thank you Keeps for sponsoring the channel. And now back to the story of the George Washington Bridge. When it opened, the George Washington Bridge connected New York and New Jersey and completed one of the first sections of the Tri-State Arterial Network recommended in 1929. In its first year of operation, the bridge was expected to carry 60 million vehicles. The Hudson River span was the world's longest suspension bridge for six years. In 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco surpassed it, with the main span of 4,200 feet. A few years after the bridge opened, new protective housings were built on the towers for the cable saddles to give the structure greater stability. Once built, the bridge significantly impacted the town, facilitating increased economic activity by optimizing transport between the two states. Better access meant business could now expand their markets and reach new customers more efficiently. This led to the growth of commerce and industry on both sides of the Hudson. It accelerated the movement of people between New York and Fort Lee. Residents could now commute more efficiently between the two areas, leading to suburbanization as people sought housing away from the city center. In turn, the increased connectivity made the Fort Lee and Washington Heights area more desirable as a place to live 
leading to the construction of residential neighborhoods, business districts, and other facilities. After World War II, in the climate of economic growth in the U.S., at the time, modifications and expansions to the bridge were needed, as the bridge now served a far larger and still growing population. These changes were needed immediately. But fortunately, the city was prepared. You see, during the design and construction of the bridge, Amman had already anticipated possible expansion of the structure. The central area was reserved for two additional lanes of vehicle traffic or two light rail tracks. The Port Authority opted for the first option and in 1946 increased the bridge capacity to eight lanes and installed a movable central barrier to maximize traffic flow at peak hours. In 1955, after nearly a decade of explosive traffic growth, various agencies in New York and New Jersey conducted a joint study of roadway structures. One of the proposals was to build a new bridge between 125th Street in Manhattan and Edgewater, New Jersey, while another was to add a six-lane lower deck to the George Washington Bridge. The latter prevailed, and construction of the lower bridge began in 1959 for $20 million, and it was an awe-inspiring undertaking, as this was all done without disturbing the operation of the bridge. 76 structural steel sections were lifted from below, but the river traffic was still considered. You see, even with the addition of the lower deck, the bridge had a clearance height of 213 feet over the Hudson, allowing ships to pass. Of course, with the addition of the lower deck, changes were also made to increase the bridge's stability by adding stiffening trusses to provide greater resistance to twisting. The extra weight required a slight adjustment to the rollers at the top of each tower. The Port Authority and other agencies also provided an additional $60 million for the construction of new access roads to relieve traffic congestion at the bridge's entrance. This included the Trans-Manhattan Expressway, the Alexander Hamilton Bridge on the New York side, and the Bergen Passaic Expressway on the Jersey side. The lower bridge and new access roads were completed on August the 29th, 1962. In early 1977, an $18.5 million project was initiated to replace the bridge's 46-year-old upper deck. The old concrete deck was removed in sections and replaced with 11 by 60 foot steel segments, each prefabricated and prepaved to be slotted into place and ready for use. All work was carried out at night, allowing all eight lanes of the upper deck to be open by morning rush hour. This project was one of the first to use orthotropic deck replacement, where the structural support units also formed the deck on a major suspension bridge. The work was completed in late 1978. The next few decades were uneventful, but then, in 1999, work began to rehabilitate nearly five miles of ramps connecting the George Washington to the roadways of New York and New Jersey. And this was long overdue, as by this point, some of the ramps dated back to the bridge's original construction in the 1920s, while others were built when the second span was added in 1962. The $38 million project was completed in May of 2001. Between 2002 and 2006, the 604-foot towers and the lower portion of the upper deck were also repainted entirely. Finally, in 2000, the bridge was relit and the towers were fitted with colored lights. Since the 4th of July, 2000, and for special occasions after that, each of the George Washington Bridge's suspension towers has been illuminated by 380 lumineers, highlighting the exposed steel structure. Each tower is fitted with a mix of 150 to 1,000 watt metal halide lamps. And although the bridge was a monumental success, a greater good for New York, it hasn't been without its darker moments. The George Washington Bridge is infamous as one of the most frequently chosen locations in the New York metropolitan area for suicides by jumping or falling from the bridge. The first such tragedy occurred even before the bridge was officially opened, with the first fatality happening on the 21st of September, 1930. News reports recall an acrobat, Norman J. Terry, as he jumped from the bridge in front of thousands of spectators. But this was not a suicide. He thought that he would live. 
Unfortunately for him, his position was wrong, and he fatally injured his neck when he hit the water below. The first deliberate suicide occurred on the 3rd of November, 1931, just over a week after the bridge's inauguration. But one of the most notorious cases of attempted suicide was in 1994, when a person calling himself Prince contacted the Howard Stern Show on the bridge and threatened to jump. Fortunately, Stern was able to dissuade him. Then there was the case of Tyler Clementes, who committed suicide by jumping off the bridge in 2010. And this very unfortunate event brought national attention to the phenomenon of cyberbullying and the difficulties faced by a now online youth. In 2012, a sad record of 18 people chose to end their lives by jumping off the bridge, while the further 43 attempted to do so but fortunately survived. The same numbers of deaths occurred in both 2014 and 2015. In 2014, however, the Port Authority police arrested 74 people. The following year, they arrested 86, meaning that perhaps without police intervention, that number could have been much higher. In 2016, the number of reported deaths dropped to 12, which was a significant decrease from previous years, while well, the Port Authority police arrested 70 people. In response to the 15 reported deaths and the 68 attempted suicides in 2017, the Port Authority took significant prevention measures, proposing to equip a two-person team from the Emergency Service Unit with special harnesses. In addition, protective netting and an 11-foot-high fence were installed along each roadway on the upper level, with the southern pavement closed from September to December in 2017 to allow for the installation of a temporary fence. Ultimately, this was followed by the installing of the 11-foot-high permanent wall on the north roadway and the permanent fence on the southern pavement. And as intense as that all sounds, the following story is truly unbelievable. On the 28th of December, 1966, a 19-year-old pilot made an emergency landing on the New Jersey side of the bridge after his plane's engine failed. Fortunately, there were no fatalities due to the light traffic at the time, but the pilot and his passengers were injured. And it's probably important to point out that there was no medium barrier on the upper deck at the time of the accident. But that was not the only spectacular event to happen on the bridge. For example, in June of 1977, two articulated lorries almost fell off the lower deck after overturning and crossing the barrier and safety net beside the roadway. One of the drivers was slightly injured and the other was unhurt. A third vehicle was also involved in the event. And somewhat astonishingly, despite occasional accidents and tragic events, the bridge has rarely been closed to traffic throughout its entire history. In fact, the first complete closure of the George Washington Bridge occurred on the 6th of August, 1980. This happened when a truck carrying highly flammable propane gas began leaking fuel across the bridge. As a safety precaution, in case the fuel caught fire, traffic across the bridge was suspended for several hours, and the 2,000 people living near the bridge were also evacuated. As the George Washington Bridge is the main route between New Jersey and New York City, this closure caused traffic jams up to 30 miles long, and the effects of this congestion were felt from more than 45 miles away. The craziness was resolved when two police officers eventually plugged the leak with an inexpensive device. But the situation gave the city a lot to think about, as before that time, trucks carrying flammable materials had been allowed to use the bridge. After the incident, New York City officials conducted a study on the advisability of banning the transportation of hazardous materials throughout the entire city. During the attacks of 9-11, several news organizations, including CNN, reported that a vehicle filled with explosives had been found on the lower level of the bridge. However, several investigations later revealed no evidence of those claims. When it was built, the George Washington Bridge changed the face of New York, stimulating economic, cultural, and social growth on both sides of the Hudson. Today, it is the 13th longest suspension bridge in the world, and in addition to facilitating the exchange of goods and ideas between the surrounding regions, this bridge has contributed significantly to the social and cultural cohesion of the East Coast. Its strategic location on the I-95 corridor, one of the nation's major transportation routes, 
makes it a key pillar of modern American infrastructure. Its continued importance as a vital transportation artery is evidenced by the constant volume of vehicles that cross its lanes daily, underscoring its essential role in maintaining the livelihood of the region. Finally, it's designated as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark from 1981. And this status does not only celebrate the bridge as an architectural structure, but also the talent and ingenuity of the engineers who designed and built it, leaving a lasting legacy on the world's civil engineering landscape, a notion that perhaps brings us full circle. So I thank you all for watching, clicking that subscribe button, and until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.